to now welcome Associate Professor Dan Moon to the stage to give us a surgical perspective and uh, Dan will be speaking on diagnosis of prostate cancer. Thank you. Thanks very much and it's a pleasure to be part of such an esteemed panel so I'm very grateful for the invitation. Uh, we've heard staging <clears throat> pretty much now is being replaced with PSMA PET. We've got the evidence for that and again the pro-PSMA trial came from Australia. We've heard a lot about the recurrence after prostatectomy. Yes, we get another tick for PSMA PET, following radiation, use of theranostics. We'll hear more and more about that, obviously. What about diagnosis of prostate cancer? And what we've heard so far is that Sid has told us that this doesn't fit appropriate use criteria in the current guidelines. So I'd like to challenge that because there's been a lot of work to the contrary. And to put it in some sort of clinical and historic context, you just need to look back at how far we've come in such a short period of time. When I started practice, men would be referred with an elevated PSA and they get literally a stab in the dark, which is a transrectal biopsy, and sometimes we'd hit the cancer and sometimes we wouldn't. And the difference between the biopsy findings and the radical prostatectomy specimen were often quite enormous. It was a pretty unsophisticated way to conduct a screening program and it gave PSA testing a bad name. The first half of the PSA era was dominated by debate about whether we're doing more harm than good, whether we're truly saving lives and population-based analyses. So we're forced to think a bit harder and do better. Bearing in mind that what we need to do here is find the perfect algorithm which can find cancer that we need to find at a curable stage, avoid the diagnosis of insignificant cancer, and even avoid biopsy in men who don't have cancer. And MRI was a massive step forward in this. For the first time, we could see and target and uh, qu quantify cancer, assess it pre-biopsy, which has been a big leap. However, it's not perfect. Every trial and every uh, review of MRI will show a consistent false negative rate. This is an example of one of my patients, a PSA going up in a 59 year old, so relatively young, MRI negative, biopsy negative, PSA is still going up and we get a PET scan and we can see a hot spot in the prostate that on radical prostatectomy and subsequent biopsy is a clear, uh, Gleason isop 3 adenocarcinoma missed on MRI found on PET. So, there's a role here. This is what started the whole thinking about what we can do with PET scan to improve our diagnostics. And our aim is to, ideally, we'd be able to use PET scan to find cancers when the MRI is negative, when tests are discordant, men with PSA rising but the MRI is negative and we're not sure what's going on, to reassure patients who have negative MRI and negative PET that they're okay, and maybe even more, pushing the boundaries, can we just make the diagnosis purely on imaging? And the award-winning primary trial was a massive step forward. This landmark trial showed for the first time really the power of PET scanning, um, led by Louise, um, as, as you know. And this took nearly 300 men with prostate cancer and added a PSMA PET prior to biopsy and then just looked at the, um, the predictive value and the diagnostic value that added. And it did outperform MRI, um, not perfectly, but the, the, the key message was when you put them together, we suddenly had a 97% sensitivity, uh, which was, uh, this is um, mind blowing. We've never had anything approaching this before. So that combination is exceptionally powerful. And on one hand, we could avoid biopsy in men who didn't have cancer if you take the PET scan into account, really up to nearly 40% of men who had equivocal or negative MRIs. And on the other hand, we could be up to 100% certain that men have cancer when you added the PET scan and looked at certain criteria. And I'll sh just show a slide on that a bit later. Furthermore, as other studies have shown, the avidity correlated with the aggressiveness of the malignancy. So you could also quantitatively assess the nature of the cancer within the prostate. We then took a subset analysis and showed that yes, there were men who had such positive findings on both MRI and PET that in this group of patients from primary, we took 140 patients with pyrads four or five lesions. If they had an SUV max over nine and a pyrads four or five, every single one had significant cancer and anyone with an SUV max over 12 had significant cancer. That's pretty, uh, pretty compelling evidence. To put this in context, only last month, one of my colleagues uh, unfortunately came to me with a PSA of 24 and obstructive symptoms, palpable locally advanced disease, and these findings on imaging, PIRADS5 and a very, very avid primary within the prostate. And he knows the evidence. He knows uh, he needs surgery. And he says, why would you do a biopsy? Well, what is that going to add? And to be honest, I couldn't think of a reason. And so for the first time, we went proceeded to surgery. And sure enough, we have, you know, T3 
uh, prostate cancer, and there are situations, these highly selected cases, where we can now be confident enough. We've been taking out testicles and kidneys for years without biopsies. So finally, with prostate cancer, we can have that level of confidence. To take it further and quantify the usefulness in the diagnostic setting, we then looked at what would happen if you added PSMA PET to risk calculators and create a nomogram based on the concepts of previous nomograms that have incorporated uh, clinical staging, PSA and MRI. And this is a nomogram we put together looking at uh, the addition of uh, SUV max and PSMA PET characteristics. And sure enough, we improved the predictive value in the area under a curve uh, compared to previous nomograms when you add PET scanning in to these other parameters. So then taking it further again, we wanted to look at what's the evidence uh, around the world looking at uh, PSMA PET in the primary setting. And we did a systematic review uh, looking at how this has been applied, not for staging, but for primary diagnosis. And the issue that we immediately found is that we have a massive inconsistency around the world, because this is early days, obviously, but there is so much variability in terms of the tracers used, the scanners used, the quality control employed, the image acquisition time, all of which will affect the final outcome and the predictive value of this test, as you know. Furthermore, what's positive? How do you define that? How do you interpret the PET scans and how do we ensure adequate and consistent clinician reporting? And Louise went back to the primary trial and took this further by introducing the primary score, which for the first time has given us a validated way and a more nuanced way to interpret PET scanning within the prostate, to the point where this is now routinely employed in all the centres that I work at that I order PSMA PET scanning at, we insist upon this scale being used. And this is a way not only looking at SUV max within a prostate, but the pattern of the uptake and being able to correlate that with the risk of there being significant cancer within the prostate. And thanks to Louise again for this slide, which she's very kindly allowed me to show. This is about to be presented this year. Louise has taken it even further and combined that primary score with the MRI PIRAD scoring system for a P score, which is now, look at these sensitivities for ISOP3 malignancy and the negative predictive value, 99, 98%. We've never, ever seen this for prostate cancer. This is really, you know, this is mind blowing and this is, um, uh, and this is a landmark landmark trial and landmark scoring system to use, so uh, congratulations to Louise for that. And this leads us then to the development of primary two, which is the next phase, because we now, as, as well been, as just said, we need randomised trials to show the difference in the outcome and be able to put this into practice. That's how we're able to get item numbers for staging a prostate cancer after pro-PSMA. So primary two, for the first time, is we're randomising men um, with equivocal or negative MRIs, because this was the group from primary that seemed to benefit the most from PSMA PET scanning. And this will involve 660 patients. And essentially what we want to show is that if we can employ PET scanning in the workup of men where the MRI has not been that useful, we'll be able to safely diagnose the same amount of cancer, so it's non-inferior, uh, but with less biopsies, less men biopsied, and a lower risk of a lower chance of diagnosis of insignificant disease. So the whole point is we um, want to reduce unnecessary biopsies. Uh, we limit to target-only biopsies, and it will mean that men get randomised either to standard of care, which is a template biopsy if the MRI is negative or pyrads three, or they get a PET scan. And if the PET scan is positive, we target that lesion. If it's negative, we avoid the biopsy altogether. Currently, we're halfway through the trial. Uh, we recruited, uh, what, 340 as of last month, 340 out of 660 patients from the centres around Australia that are listed. Um, but this is going to really be able to give us even more Im impetus and emphasis to show us the place of PSMA PET scanning, which has um, been a really promising addition to the algorithm of men um, to help put to bed all the debate about prostate cancer screening and testing and, uh, and the sort of harm we're doing versus the benefit that we're able to achieve for these men. So take home message is really, obviously we need standardisation and we've seen already this morning practice changing roles for this modality in both in staging, evaluating recurrence, but now assessment of primary tumour as well as the option of theranostics. Thanks again for the opportunity to talk.